All right, good evening everyone and welcome to Take Charge for May of 2018. Um, over the years we've spent an awful lot of time talking about heart disease and the various risk factors that lead to the development and progression of disease. So our topic today is to talk about one of those. You'll remember last month we talked about nutritional things that we could do to try and control our blood pressure. Um, today we're going to listen to our medical director here, Dr. Paul O, and he's going to talk to us about blood pressure, what it is, and why it needs to be controlled. So, Dr. O, thank you very much. Thank you, Rob, and uh, welcome to everyone. It's always a pleasure to be able to engage with the group. Uh, so we have a formal part of this presentation that will last about 45 minutes or so. Uh, then we've got lots of time for questions and uh, addressing some of your personal issues. We can do that in a group, in a larger group, and we can also do that in smaller group as well. Okay. Um, so high blood pressure is uh, a common topic for all of us, right? And these are some of the questions that often come up around blood pressure. These um, slides, uh, many of them are drawn from Hypertension Canada and the Canadian Hypertension Education Program. It's available as a website to you. All of this information is publicly available. And I've added a few more bits of information into this deck uh, to make it a little bit more interesting and engaging, I hope. These are the topics that we're going to cover off in the next little while. Uh, a revisit, a re-step. Hopefully we all know what a blood pressure is, but uh, going back to basics, we'll talk about what the, what the concepts there would be. What's the difference when our blood pressure gets high and what are the risks of high blood pressure? How might we prevent it? Uh, how to find out if you have high blood pressure, how do you measure it? Um, and what are some of the treatments? And then into this we'll also pepper some of the discussion and maybe even a little controversy about what's happening in Canada versus what's happening in, in the United States around blood pressure definitions and treatment guidelines. Okay? That's a fair bit of information. Are you good to go? Yeah. Outstanding. We're good to go and here, here we are. So what is blood pressure? So we know it as kind of something you put a cuff on your arm and then you measure something by listening to the arteries. What we're trying to get at is the action of heart pumping. When each time the heart pumps, it pushes blood through our bodies, traveling through the arterial system, those blood vessels that carry blood away from the heart. They are muscular and elastic, so they stretch and come back down. Stretch and come back down every time the heart beats. When the blood vessels maximally stretch, that's when the pressure is the highest, and that denotes the high number of blood pressure. When it relaxes, that's the resting state. We need the blood to pump. We need your hearts to go all the time to push blood around, of course, and that's how we move nutrients and oxygen around. When the blood pressure starts to creep up, Often in our middle years, this may happen for reasons that are mysterious, or as we get older and blood vessels start to get uh, uh, stiffer, blood pressure will rise. And when it goes up, we recognize that there are some problems that can occur with um, that higher blood pressure. Usually you're not aware what your blood pressure number is. Some people feel very in tune with their bodies. You may think my blood pressure is high, but many times, people may have elevated blood pressure and not have any sensation with it. These are the numbers that we're going to talk about and that you're very familiar with. You should all know your blood pressure numbers, keep track of your blood pressure numbers for many of you. The upper number when the vessels are maximally stretched, that's the systolic or the higher number. An ideal number would be around 120. When the blood vessel contracts and is relaxed, the pressure goes down, that is your diastolic pressure. An ideal number would be 80 or less. And you can already start thinking in your heads of what your own number might be, or if you don't know what your number is, then that's gonna be some opportunity for us to go and measure some of these things, okay? Blood pressure does go up with age. And it's interesting, in some of the older textbooks that, that I can lay my hands on, it used to be written that blood pressure, the upper number, the systolic blood pressure, uh, the old textbooks would say, take 100 and add it to your age, and that was what was called normal blood pressure. So if you do the math in your head, some of you, that might that be 120, maybe 130, 
Do I hear 140 or 150 or 160? Maybe a 170. 129. 129. Thank you very much. You've been 129 forever, yes? Um, and we all recognize that um, that old textbook, that wasn't right. Well, in a way it was right because in the 50, 60 year old, uh, 50, 60 years ago, that might have been the usual blood pressure that was around the community before we had any idea that salt might be an issue or that medications were available, that people routinely walked around with blood pressures of 160 or 170 or 180. But we also recognized when the pressure went that high, bad things happened. Today we say that's not a normal blood pressure anymore and we really need to do that because when the blood pressure gets that high, the heart has to work much harder to push the blood around and this can create subsequent problems. So what should your blood pressure be? How high should it be? And these are Canadian guidelines and I'm going to show you some American numbers in just a little while and you can kind of line yourself up to what do I look like? Am I uh, most people? If I am most people, that is, I, I don't have one of these other conditions, then um, the Canadian hypertension group would say, if your blood pressure is less than 140, over 90, you're probably okay. We say you don't have high blood pressure at that level. Again, I'm gonna challenge that in a moment. If you are over the age of 80, will give you a little bit of latitude for reaching the age of 80. And we know that some people have stiffer pipes when they get older and that blood pressure will rise a little bit, but not too much more. So we'll give you 150 over 90. And if you happen to be living with diabetes, and that might be one out of four people in this room, we recognize that blood pressure can be a particular nuisance, especially to the kidneys in the body. And if we hammer the kidneys repeatedly, with extra blood pressure, that's a little bit too much stress. So we like the blood pressure to be just a little bit lower in that situation, okay? So that's the Canadian guidance. Find where you match on this, and then there's some guidance. Of course, individual results will vary. Your situation may be unique, and there may be a slightly different target in your situation depending on who you are, what medications you're taking, what other conditions you may have, okay? So if, you're, if your kind of label isn't on here, if your number isn't on here, that is why. So high blood pressure or hypertension, um, the interesting thing of course is that blood pressure sometimes is hard to nail down. If we actually track your blood pressure through the day, and some of you do this, or some of you have worn a monitor throughout the day, and what we know is that blood pressure goes up and down, and it has to, because it's keeping up with you. Sometimes you're up and sometimes you're down and your blood pressure will track accordingly and that's good and healthy. But if on average your blood pressure is above the levels that we just talked about, that's when we're going to de define or, or, or say that your blood pressure is too high and that you have hypertension. Okay, so we promised some American data and last year um, each year, Canada and the United States comes up with different sort of guidelines, different updates on what they consider to be good or not so good around blood pressure. In the last few years, the Americans have kind of deviated. We know the Americans deviate a little bit, yeah? Um, in big ways, and it's fun to watch from afar. What they've done with blood pressure is a little bit controversial because what they have said is that the only truly normal people out there, at least in the United States, vis-a-vis -vis blood pressure, are those that have a number that is less than 120 and less than 80. All right, so those numbers, and if we kind of reflect on it in our own heads, those of you who know your blood pressure, you might say, well, that's pretty stringent. That's pretty low. What they have specifically said is that the category of people who would be considered okay in Canada, like if your blood pressure was 120 uh, to 129, over 70 say, in Canada we'd say that's perfectly acceptable, that's good. That's good blood pressure control. But the Americans are suggesting that that in fact is too high. And if your blood pressure is 130 to 139, over 80 to 89, they even call that now hypertension in the first stage. 
And then you'll see that they actually get to the 140 over 90, which is the Canadian definition of stage two hypertension. So what this does is it creates millions more Americans today that would be receiving this label of hypertension. It's actually very interesting. It's a public health kind of big issue because theoretically more people will be on drugs, more people might have difficulties with life insurance because suddenly they have this label of hypertension. So this seems quite controversial, but in the end, my thought about any kind of guideline is common sense must prevail. And I think there's commonality about where we get to in the end with these numbers, okay? Let's carry on. So, if there is this kind of question, a blood pressure greater than or equal to 140 over 90 is considered too high in your healthcare provider's office. Whether you're in Canada or in the, in the United States or in Europe or in anywhere else, what do you think? Is this true? Let's just do a show of hands. Higher than 140 over 90, do you think that's high? Okay, does anybody think that that is okay to have a pressure higher than 140 over 90? Couple of you, yeah. So most of us would agree that probably that number, more than 140 over 90 for most people, is going to be too high. And specifically, just to do a short recap, if you have diabetes, it's definitely too high. Um, if you measure it at home, ideally, 135 over 85 is the number that we're looking at. And if you're an American, more than 120 over 80 is too high. Okay, we have agreement, 140 over 90, a little bit too high. Okay, high blood pressure is bad for you and, and Rob already introduced the notion that it contributes to many of the conditions or afflictions that we have. Whether you have had a heart attack, heart failure, a stroke, if you're living with diabetes, if you're just walking around with high blood pressure, that's not a good deal. Therefore, we should know what the blood pressure number is and we should probably do something about it because if we leave high blood pressure unmanaged for a long period of time, it starts to affect many different organ systems in our body. Why is that? Because every organ system in our body has blood vessels in it. It needs a blood supply to function. For instance, the heart here has important blood vessels and many of you have been in the program because of blood vessel problems. If you force a lot of blood pressure down that blood vessel over a long period of time, that vessel starts to thicken and narrow. If you restrict blood flow in the heart, that's not a good thing. If you force the heart to beat extremely forcefully for many years, the heart muscle starts to weaken, it gets tired and your heart can start to stretch out and do uh, un un uh, unacceptable things. Blood vessels are in our brains and if our blood vessels start to close down and pinch, then we can develop brain problems characterized by memory losses or in fact having small strokes in our brains that we may or may not know about. Blood vessels in the back of the eyes they can actually be affected. The, the eyes can be the, the window into the soul. I can tell your blood pressure by just looking at the back of your eye, if you let me. And when I see those vessels start to narrow down, I know that your blood, vessel ha your blood pressure has been too high for too long. And that's why docs do that. Although they tend to do that a little bit less. We've talked about the kidneys as well. The blood vessels, there's lots of blood vessels in your kidneys. And if they've suffered from high blood pressure for a long period of time, and they close down, your kidneys get very unhappy. They don't filter well anymore, and the kidney function starts to, to deteriorate. For some people, all those things may not matter so much, but this one might. Uh, blood vessels also affect some of our other vital organs. And low blood flow in vital places is not a good idea. And you can see how upset that, that woman is in particular when the blood vessels don't work in the nether regions. How can you prevent high blood pressure? Because this sounds like a very bad thing. Um, it's an important question because blood pressure can, high blood pressure may be prevented um, and or managed very, very well. So if we look at the factors that are under your control around your blood pressure, you recognize on this list what you eat may influence blood pressure, whether you smoke, drink too much, or if you're not active enough, if your weight is higher than desirable, if you're under too much stress, if you don't sleep, if you have diabetes, if you've got kidney problems already, all of these things are going to contribute to high blood pressure. <coughs> 
And you can make a mental list. Are any of these things in play for you? And can you influence any of them to bring your blood pressure down? And anybody that I've seen who has high blood pressure and we have a discussion around medications, usually the question can be, do I have to take this? Can I do anything else? And great, we have a list of a dozen things that you can actually do to affect your blood pressure. There are some things that we can't change, like the fact that we may be getting a little bit older, like uh, gender, and uh, sex and gender, and some of our family history. But there are many things that we can. Here is a little acronym that could play in your head. It's not a great acronym, but it goes with this word called pressure. Um, and it kind of brings on, it, it, it uh, echoes off the, the list that we just talked about. So pressure, the P for physical activity, R for reducing your weight, E for eating a healthy diet, S for stopping smoking, S for less sodium, U for you. Man, that's a real stretch. You can control your blood pressure. R for your, taking your medications and avoiding excess of alcohol. So there may be a memory aid for you in terms of controlling your pressure, follow pressure. And here we're spelling it out once again. Be active, eat well, be smoke free, eat less salt, have less stress, take the medications that are important to you and moderate your alcohol intake, okay? So, how about this question? Why should we care about high blood pressure? Is high blood pressure a major cause of stroke and dementia? Yes. Who thinks, yes, that's true? Anybody think that that is false? Well, that's great. We have unanimity in the audience. Everyone agrees. And um, we may not have said that, actually, 30 minutes ago. If we said, is there a way to, to prevent memory loss in all of us? Blood pressure control may not have been the thing that we thought about, but blood pressure control along with all the other things that we've talked about can be a good way of preserving our memories and avoiding bad things happening to our brain. Outstanding. So high blood pressure is a major cause of stroke and dementia along with other risk factors. Uh, reminder that blood pressure affects everything wherever there is a blood vessel. Um, and on average, each risk factor that we add on top of blood pressure doubles the risk even more. So everything goes together. We can, uh, uh, on the good news side, control this and choose our destinies to some extent. And here is one more recall quite kind of question for the audience. You can usually tell if your blood pressure is high by the way that you feel. You can usually tell. Who thinks that? Is that true? A few of you. Who thinks that's false? And more on the false side. Now, I'm not doubting people. Again, some people feel, I'm so angry right now. My blood pressure is probably high. It probably is true. But for many of us, even just sitting around, and some of you have this experience in your doctor's office, that you may be sitting as calmly as, you, as possible, and your blood pressure may still be high, and you may not be aware of it. So, once again, the only way to find out about blood pressure is to actually measure it. Usually there are no warning signs unless the blood pressure is extremely high, and we really do need to measure this on a regular basis. Okay, so that brings up the topic about measurement. How are we going to do this? So how do I know if I have high blood pressure? You can't feel it. You have to measure it. Um, and then here are some points about, for instance, how often should we measure it? So if you already have high blood pressure, or if you're living with a heart condition, or you're living with diabetes, then you probably should be checking your blood pressure regularly. And in fact, every time you see your nurse practitioner, um, a different healthcare practitioner, your doctor, hopefully your blood pressure is being measured. If your blood pressure is in fact quite normal, then you don't need to be obsessive about it and you can wait until your next visit, which may be in six months, a year or two years. If it's starting to creep up, then we want to keep an eye on it a little bit more. And if it indeed is high already, then we'll want to check it pretty regularly. And my recommendation actually is that you should probably invest in getting your own blood pressure cuff. Spend the hundred dollars and get your cuff because it's your blood pressure and it's your body and you should know what your numbers are like. So who can check your blood pressure? Your healthcare provider might be one. 
your pharmacist. And many of our pharmacies are actually set up with pretty good blood pressure cuffs, and that's a nice time. If you're picking up your medications, spend a couple minutes and get your blood pressure checked. Your nurse may do this. You may do this. Interjected here is one kind of new concept is maybe others in your community can also help with blood pressure. I love these kind of community sorts of initiatives. And the one I'm speaking of it deals with this. So the New England Journal of Medicine is, is the premier journal of medical care. And earlier this year, they published this study. It sounds very sciencey, doesn't it? A cluster randomized trial of blood pressure reduction. The part I love is black barber shops. So, in barber shops, has anybody had their blood pressure checked in a barber shop or the hairdressing salon? It's actually a neat kind of place to do it, right? Well, most of us will visit a, a hair establishment of some sort, right? Except for my son, um, who does not like uh, barber shops of any sorts. Uh, but that's a different story. But th what's really neat about this, uh, this slide is actually from a program called the Black Barbershop Health Outreach Program. And you can see their goal is to screen half a million African American men for their blood pressure and diabetes. That we need to meet people where they are. In this particular study that was published in this prestigious medical journal, 319 men with high blood pressure were identified across 50 barbershops in the Los Angeles area. And the really neat intervention was their blood pressure was measured while they were getting a nice quaff. And then if the blood pressure was high, a pharmacist was waiting in the wings who came in and had a chat with that person as they were getting their trim. <laughs> kind of a neat idea, isn't it? We don't have to set up fancy offices. We don't need really fancy equipment. And the pharmacist had the authorization to offer medications at these visits. What they found was for people that did not partake of the medical pharmacy conversation, their blood pressure actually dropped a little bit because there was some education provided. But look at what happened when the barber was twinned up with the pharmacist and they had a conversation during the haircut. The blood pressure went down in these people about 30 points over a course of six months. The difference between the two arms is 20 millimeters of blood pressure. This now becomes perfectly normal. And that's very, very exciting. So we don't need fancy things. We need more barber shops, or we need more grocery stores, or we need more nail salons. Whatever it is, we need to meet people where they are to measure blood pressure and maybe offer some neat initiatives. And maybe you've got ideas as well. What we love about this initiative is this grassroots, it's community, it's doing good things in your neighborhood, and this is where we can actually change health in a big way. When you see your doc, one conversation that you can have. Actually, let me take this impromptu poll. Who had their blood pressure checked last time you saw your physician or your nurse? Okay, did you rest? That was almost everybody. Um, did you have a period of time of quiet reflection in a calm room, no noise, no conversation before your blood pressure was measured? Hands up. And that's 10 of you now, okay? So for the rest of you, what happened? You were late or you were waiting in, the, so either you were late and rushing or you're waiting in that room for minutes, hours, days, who knows? And when you got into the room and had your blood pressure check, were you nice and calm? Or were you talking about the, the latest stressor in your life? Were some of you being examined simultaneously with your blood pressure? Were some of you having an examination of private parts while your, while your blood pressure was being checked? You know, crazy things happen. Ideally, if we really want a good measurement of blood pressure, we should have what the 10 of you had, quiet, calm, and even better, let's take the doctor or the nurse out of the equation. Let's put a little device on you and then we should leave the room. Have any of you had that done? Good, many of you have, and that's exciting because what, what research has shown over the last 20 years is that the interaction between you and I creates a situation where blood pressure goes up. 
So using these automated devices are really, really good, and that actually predicts much better what's going on with the organs in your body. Similarly, taking blood pressure measurements out of the office and into your home is a much better thing to do. If you are going to buy a cuff, then you can look for this symbol. This means that that blood pressure machine has been tested, it's reliable, it's accurate, it is now recommended by Hypertension Canada. So look for that symbol. It's like the gold seal of approval on your blood pressure machine, okay? If you're doing your blood pressure measurement, just like we talked about, some simple kinds of steps to follow, and sometimes we don't take the time to get a good measurement. So, read the instructions, you know. Men, you are terrible at this, aren't you? Just take the bloody machine out of the package and get it going. <laughs> read the instructions, would you? Go to the bathroom before your measurement. The full bladder is guaranteed to make your blood pressure go up. You all have had that experience at one point or another. Sit comfortably, feet flat on the floor, back supported, arm at heart level. So if you've got a table, put a pillow on it, make everything kind of level up, and that's going to be a good way of measuring the right kind of blood pressure. A bare arm is the preferred method, or if you've got a thin shirt, you can also put that cuff on. Put the cuff on and then don't do anything for five minutes. Five minutes is a long time to wait. But if you want a truly accurate measurement that will determine whether you get more medications or that if your medications are in fact working well for you, that's worthwhile. Take a couple of readings with a break in between. Record all this down in a little diary or an Excel spreadsheet. The engineers that I've seen have been very good at putting it onto a spreadsheet, graphing it for me. All of that is really, really helpful. Bring that to your next appointment, okay? I'm sure you've received that advice before. Don't do these things. These are things that make your blood pressure all messed up. Simple things like crossing your legs. When you cross your legs, you cut off circulation, you make your pressure go up. Interesting. Don't take your pressure if you're in a hurry. If you don't have time for it, don't do it now. It can wait. Um, don't smoke 30 minutes before measuring. When you, if you smoke, then that makes blood vessels react and can make blood pressure go up. Preferably, don't smoke at all, of course. Don't drink caffeine 30 minutes before the measurement. Um, that can make your blood pressure grow, go up. Don't just have a big meal. Don't wear tight clothing. Don't watch television. Don't talk to somebody. Don't measure if you are cold, nervous, uncomfortable, or in pain. So the lots of do's and don'ts for getting a good, relaxed, calm blood pressure and again that is worthwhile if it's driving treatment decisions. Okay, so if we have measured blood pressure, we've determined blood pressure is high, what are we going to do about it? And the Canadians have made this just a little bit complex, right? You've got to now match up who you are and find the number with who you are. So if you are most people, we've already said these should be less than 140 over 90. If you are most people up to the age of 80 or more, or over the age of 80, then we'll give you some latitude. We've talked about that. Most people, if you're checking blood pressure at home, it's 135 over 85. And people with diabetes, 130 over 80. Those should be familiar to you. But there's all these different categories. The Americans have said, maybe this is a little bit complex. So here's the American guideline. Very simple. You can just write this on a sim simple scrap of paper. So instead of all of that consideration, for most people, if you can be less than 130 and less than 80, that's going to meet most situations. And for me, I, I think that those things are actually saying the same thing. Because there's commonality to that. And if I had to give you a number, again, individual results will vary. Some of you, 120 over 75 might be the number that we go for. Others, it might be 130 over 80 exactly. And for others of you, it might be 155 over 50, depending on the kind of blood vessels that you have. Okay? So the problem with this, it, it, the, the great thing about this is that it's very simple. The problem is that it ignores some of that individuality for us. Okay? So don't, don't get too distressed about that, but that's just what the Americans have done. Okay. So here's a few more posing questions. If you saw your doc or you went to the pharmacy and put your arm in the tube and you found one blood pressure that was high, if it was 142 over 92, does that one reading mean that you have high blood pressure? One time, one reading. The answer, true, 
The answer, false. And most of you are false. And the reasons are, I think, you, we, based upon our discussion so far, we know that blood pressure goes up and down. And many of us, at some point in the day, will have a blood pressure 142 over 92. If we're uh, excited, stressed, hurrying, working out, our blood pressure's maybe that high, and that's good. Oftentimes, if we follow the steps that we just talked about, rest, calm, quiet, no smoking, no alcohol, no food, comfortable clothing, the blood pressure will usually go down in a minute or two. So it'll be in the right place. So before we give someone the label of high blood pressure, it's worth repeating this a few times. Um, and, and maybe some of you have gone through that. Uh, and it's important just to remind, remind us what, about that. So if I have blood, high blood pressure, what can I do? Medications are often on the horizon and we would of course start with all of those good things in that pressure ac uh, acronym, right? Think about what we eat, how we move, not smoking, uh, doing all of those really good things. But then if our blood pressures are consistently high, then we might think about initiating some kind of medication. And in the Canadian guideline, once again, it gets a little bit complex you got to find who you look like once again and see what, what is the point where medications might be initiated. And they said, for instance, that if we're a low-risk individual, your blood pressure might go up quite high before we say we're going to give you drugs. We'll say you have high blood pressure, but we might say go eat well, move more, quit smoking, moderate alcohol intake, come back in six months and we see, we see where you've come to, okay? That's if your overall risk of anything happening is low. If you have a moderate risk, that is you have high blood pressure and you've got high cholesterol and somebody in your family had a stroke or, or, or heart disease, then we might say, even if your blood pressure is a little bit high, let's think about medications. Once again, if you have diabetes, and high blood pressure. We want to reduce the stress on your system, in particular the kidneys. So if your blood pressure is even a little bit high, we're gonna offer you medications early on to protect the whole system. And then there is this notion that's come out in the last couple of years, that if you have some other special characteristics and we call you high risk, and there's this thing called sprint that we'll go into in a second, then we might say, we're going to offer you medications at a very early phase. Okay? Want to hear more? Good. Okay. So what does Sprint mean? Once again, we go to our friendly journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, from a couple of years ago. And there, in, in that edition, there was published this study that was called Sprint. In Sprint, they looked at a few thousand people that were called, quote, high risk. And what does high risk mean in, in the context of this study? They said, if you were at least 50 years old, and you can play this game along with me, how many of these things apply to me? Uh, if you're at least 50 years old, if your blood pressure on the, the upper number was 130 to 180, and you also had some kind of increased risk of a cardiovascular problem, a heart problem, a brain problem, because you had either a previous heart attack or stroke or heart surgery, you've had a kidney problem, you've got other risk factors like high cholesterol or family history, or indeed if your age was even over the age of 75. So if all of these things applied, then you were called high risk and you were entered into this study. Any questions about that? So we're kind of adding up these things, and you can kind of play bingo in your own head. Am I at least 50? Is my blood pressure high? Do I have one of these other things? And actually for our populations of our, of our friends in rehabilitation, many of these things are in place, so it becomes relevant. What they did was looked at kind of conventional therapy. So this is blood pressure that's shown on this vertical axis. And this is five years of follow-up that's shown on the horizontal axis. The blue line represents people that were managed in the usual way. So if you had all of these attributes and we offered you typically about two 
blood pressure medications, your blood pressure smoothed out at a level of around 135 over 75. And in Canadian standards, we would have said, this looks okay. We fit our guidelines. This is not so bad. The interesting part of the study was if we adopted a more intensive approach, offered you a third medicine instead of just two, you took three, and your blood pressure dropped by about 15 extra points and sustained there for the next five years, that's an interesting thing. Your next question is, so what? But that's the comparison, right? Of a kind of high normal blood pressure versus a pretty good blood pressure. What happened to these folks was this that if you're in the blue line, that is you had okay blood pressure, over the course of five years, about 9% of the population experienced a heart attack, needed to go to hospital because of their heart, had a brain problem like a stroke, or they actually died because of some heart problem. Instead, in the orange line, were people that had that lower level of blood pressure for five years and their risk of a bad thing happening was lowered by about 25 percent by having that lower level of blood pressure. So the question would be do you want to be normal or do you want to be really really normal? And that created actually a lot of buzz in the community about how we thought about blood pressure and what reasonable targets might be for individuals. Okay? It led to a little bit of a split between Canadian and American guidelines and this is in part why the Americans said that if you've got some risk factors you should be aiming to get well below 130 and well below 80 so that you're looking more like this orange line. Does that make sense? Okay. And for us in the room it might be something that you discuss with your doc if you haven't already. If you're on medications for blood pressure already the question we should ask is what is my target? And again, individual responses will vary and your situations might be quite different and they may not be what's represented on the board, but for some of you this may be a slightly different approach. What you need to do or what you need to be willing to do is say I am going to take an extra medication or I am going to do something different with my lifestyle to get that <coughs> blood pressure down there. Okay. So why are we doing this? As, that, as those studies have kind of alluded to, that we can get some benefits by controlling blood pressure. We can reduce the amount of stress on the heart or indeed developing this condition called heart failure where the heart stretches and loses its ability to pump uh, the way it should. Uh, brain problems or stroke, heart attack and death, all of these results, um, benefits result from treating high blood pressure. We've said that to con really control the situation well, healthy lifestyle choices will matter and medicines will also matter. A couple thoughts about medicines and maybe there'll be some questions about your medications. Usually that is a common thing in our interactive parts of this. A few kind of motherhood things. Gosh, medicines only work if you take them. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. um, and what's interesting, we know we heard some news last week, for instance, in the news that um, even medicines, we've got some power over the medicines that we take. If you take an active medicine, it will lower your blood pressure. If you take an inactive medication, that may also lower your blood pressure, right? We heard about the placebo and the nocebo effects. That's actually very interesting. So the act of taking things actually works. Most medicines take up to six weeks. So be patient as a patient, right? My doc gave me this medicine last week. My blood pressure is no different. That medicine is no good and my doc is also no good. All right? So rethink that conversation and say, I got to give this time. My blood pressure has been high for 10 or 20 years. The medicines need some time to work. Stopping a treatment when blood pressure returns to normal may result in blood pressure going back up. So it's not a cure, right? Um, it's control but not a cure necessarily, although some people may actually have some lasting effects. Most of the drugs that we use to control blood pressure are also good for your heart. Conversely, we've had this conversation in our program before. Many of you are living with heart conditions. We're giving these pills for blood pressure and quite rightly you ask the question, why are they giving me these blood pressure drugs? 
because they serve a dual purpose. They lower blood pressure, but they also protect the heart as well. Most people with high blood pressure need two or more, and that can actually be a good thing if we're trying to bring our numbers down to those right kinds of levels. And lifestyle changes are also needed, uh, and they work well in concert. So here's a question um, that kind of rings off of what we've just talked about. If you are taking pills for high blood pressure, you will need to stay on them for the rest of your life. What do you think? True? True, mostly true, false? And the answer would be, you're both right. That this is mostly true. That we've kind of hammered at you and said, if you're taking pills for your blood pressure, stick with them, they're gonna work. And if you stop taking them, blood pressure goes up. But there are a few people in whom blood pressure can go down. If you've come a long way in terms of lifestyle changes, changing diet, changing alcohol, doing all these things, Maybe you don't need those medications, all of them, or maybe you need fewer of those medications. So think about that. And um, how about this one? If I start taking pills for high blood pressure, I don't have to worry about lifestyle. I can eat what I want. I can be as inactive as I want. I can pick up cigarette smoking at the age of 72. It's a fun thing, I hear. What do you think, true? False. Okay, great. That We have a unanimous result there. Lifestyle is indeed important. Of course, something that we promote widely in our program. So wrapping this up, a uh, uh, call back to this notion of pressure to control your pressure, all of these good things that you can do, including medications um, as you need them as well. If you want more information, go to that Hypertension Canada website, which has a convenient website name of hypertension.ca if you want to learn more.